<laughs> okay, I'd like to welcome you to our seminar today that is um, co-organized by the uh, Soil Science Group at uh, UWA as well as the Australian uh, Society for Soil Science. Uh, we have an, a very well-known speaker, Bill Bowden, and I'd like to introduce him. And he sent me this whole page of his uh, uh, career, but what I really would like to pick up is uh, that he started already in 1961 with the Department of Agriculture. 50th anniversary. 50th anniversary. As a, as a cadet, I'm not so sure what that is, but he must have asked a lot of questions, so he must have been sent off to do a degree then at the university, which he finished in 65, and then uh, he must have still asked too many questions, so he did actually his PhD mm -hmm. at UWA, and uh, that was, I uh, I think you finished in 72 or 73. And he has now many, many years of experience on uh, fertilizers, uh, in particular in the last years on modeling. And there are a number of activities on carbon dynamics, nutrients, soil fertility, potassium, nitrogen. So there's a host of activities on the modeling side. And Bill sees himself as the intermediate between research and applications. And, uh, and I expect that. Well, that will come through in this talk. So, uh, welcome to. Thinking there, Christoph. Thank you. Um, yes, thanks for the opportunity. As I say, it is 50 years since I was a cadet as an under. I was with the ag department as a cadet, so they paid my way through. Uh, but I just racked up 50 years with the ag department because, even though I hadn't done 50 years, they gave me 50 years because I uh, paid out leave took me out to beyond 50 years. You see, so. I thought it was pretty good math in that. Um, <coughs> I, uh, Jilksy tells me that I used to intimidate all the little girl presenters at seminars when I came along when I was doing my PhD and subsequently because I'd always get them with the question, yeah, but what does it mean for the farmer? Today what I'm going to do is start with what it means with the farmer and perhaps end up with what uh, some questions for research people and so on. Uh, this is a very simplistic presentation. At one level I wanted to go into the detail of surface chemistry and all the rest to impress my peers at the uni, but uh, I had to prepare a talk for farmers last week, so I thought I'd hang my hat pretty much on that. So uh, all we've got to do is work out how I click this thing through. I just use the mouse, is that right? Yep. Um, just to context you about or oh, eight or nine years ago people started reporting and probably knew well before that up at 50 and 100 parts per million soil test where our critical levels are normally down at about 30 or 40 parts per million up at that level they were getting massive responses to phosphate applied to crops in the high rainfall area and uh, of course the immediate and most profound question known to man is why why is it so and uh, there were lots of hypotheses about why it would be so and uh, one of them was simply that cropping has gone into those areas and had never been there much before so maybe we just had never validated our soil testing under appropriate conditions of yield and soil type but that was so counterintuitive and disobeyed all our models I love models that are falsified because that's the way you go forward but it, uh, that we thought we'd go and have a look and part of that deal was to do a few trials and uh, CSBP did and Summit did and, uh, and uh, Narelle uh, Hill come Simpson did and showed that these were definitely repeatable and, and aberrant conditions, these high P responses at high soil test. Uh, and so we worked through a, um, uh, and that's the sort of thing we're looking at there, 52 parts per million uh, and here the farmer's left his phosphate off. I've got biomass figures there, 1.9. Over here at his normal rate, which was about 12 down the spout, 12 of P down the spout, 6.7. And over there, 11.3. A linear response to phosphate at 50 parts per million is so counterintuitive and so ridiculously wrong that we had to look into it. And... Um, Bill, how, how was, what form was the P being invaded? It was as, um, in this case, well, in this case he was using DAP, 
but he, uh, we basil in for these things. Most of the time, uh, we just got them to leave everything off at seeding, and then they went across. So there could be a minor depression in yield due to lack of N at seeding, but most unlikely. Um, so, what what was causing this? And there are a whole lot of hypotheses there around which you could build on as theses and PhD theses and so on. Um, the um, best one was the root pruning one because the, this, a lot of this work came when people uh, were getting massive responses to pea following canola and uh, we were blaming canola as, as the devil in the thing either through its uh, sterilising effects on uh, buscular mycorrhizae or um, uh <coughs> there was another one with canola um, oh uh no, oh, the residual herbicides that go along with canola uh, pruning roots. The point about root pruning is that you can have very high chemical availabilities in the soil, but if the roots can't get to it, you might as well go home. You get very big responses to applied fertiliser. It negates uh, soil test critical levels that you do under normal conditions. Uh, so there's a whole list of things. On the list was non-wetting soils and I conned $25,000 out of GRDC for a year's work to see if the non-wetting soils which are predominate in that area were interacting with nutrition in a major way. Now there are two ways that they do that. One is that if you relieve the non-wetting, which has been done by people like Dan here and so on, then you induce a nitrogen deficiency, your mobile nutrients go out. If you don't relieve it, then your immobiles can be completely unavailable because they're sitting in dry soil all the time. And there's a whole story there that I won't go into, but we spent a project <laughs> looking at could we replace phosphate fertiliser with wetting agent? And we found we couldn't, uh, but that might have been because we didn't know the appropriate technology for using the appropriate wetting agents. Uh, but we were able... Uh, from site to site, we got rid of the. We still got massive responses in the present. Uh, in the, uh, there was no aluminium toxicity. We still had massive responses when we had IMEs as a residue, and uh, we got massive responses at a series of trials. It looked like it was a complex problem, and wetting agent wasn't the only answer. I was getting desperate when I got down to tilth, lack of tilth. Uh, these soils are very much when they went cropping there no till was well and truly in place so they didn't even get a good cultivation uh, and I've had previous work where just providing a loose seed bed so that seedlings can explore and get the 10 nutrients that you haven't put down the spout in the fertiliser that they have to have from the soil getting that early, getting early vigour and so on is an important thing and so there are some soils certainly where tilth is a major issue, no till no, is no tilth and then gravel is a question mark which if I have time we'll come back to. So we put a, a trial in in 2009 and that was it was on one of these high fixing gravels, 75 part per million soil test and you can see the pH profile increasing with depth. Now in the wheat belt one of the main problems is a band of low pH at somewhere 20 to 40 centimetres depth and there are reasons for that, to my money, mainly to do with the cation anion balance. In this case, in the high rainfall areas, the main reason for the profile being very acid at the surface is because of the major contribution of the nitrogen cycle to acidification when you grow legume crops in this circumstance. And the nitrogen cycle generates protein, uh, protons, which um, cause that sort of profile. Now, um, my techo took the money we had for one year out to a third year and put in this trial and uh, it's don't waste your time too much on it we were looking at wetting and so we were looking at wetting agents and cultivation and so on <coughs> but let's just have a look at the uh, the farmer then went, went across with 0, 100 and 200 that's 20 and 40 of P as triple super and the whole thing was a second canola crop and that, I don't know how that comes up there, but in the foreground is the nil phosphate strip. At 75 parts per million in the soil, anywhere else you would expect that to be up to full production. 
I loved this because this was back to the good old days when I did new land farming and we got massive responses and you had think data to play with, real data, you know, you could do it at the biomass level or the photographic level. Didn't have to measure things in infinite detail and claim the second or third significant figure. And these strips that are going across here happen to be um, hydrated lime. And what the lime has done is it's allowed the, the crop at nil phosphate down the spout to use the soil reserves. Now my techo was pretty smart, he used hydrated lime, that's quick lime, and it, it works very rapidly. If you use lime sand it takes longer. But anyhow, the guts of the thing was, uh, was that we were getting these massive responses at this site to lime. I'd eliminated a city at, at other sites where we had this same problem of strips of nothing when you left P off, but at this particular site um, it showed this massive response and there's a, a bit of a close-up on it. Uh, we also had a plough in there and, uh, and the sorts of results in the biomass were like that. Well, you'll notice the blue things with nil with nil P, the only ones that are coming up, and sorry Louise, no bloody error bars here, uh, but the blue ones, the, the incorporated lime is nearly caught up to 20 and 40 of P, and the, um, the lime on the surface is not very effective, and then all these other wetting treatments and things are quite ineffective. Even the plough on its own is ineffective in that particular figure. And um, when you go to the yields, that's what we got. We're, pardon me, where again the blue ones do pretty much as happened before. But you'll notice that there's no response at 20 of P. That is, we've 20 of P down the spout has removed this effect altogether. A lovely interaction. And 40 of P there upset me because they were all better than 20 of P, whereas in the previous slide, 20 and 40 were much of a muchness. Now the implication for that is a change in fertility and that's a problem with a cross-plot trial. The farmer just did strips across and I assume that we went to deeper soil up the hill and therefore the, the 40 of P ones which were up the hill were able to finish better. So for the same biomass early they finished off and did better. So that said, let's have another trial. But before I leave that one, just note here that <coughs> the ones without lime, if you look at the surface 10 centimetres of uh, calcium chloride extractable aluminium, they're up well beyond the five parts per million toxic level. Uh, and then the, uh, last year that same area was put in by the farmer. We said, please leave your fertiliser off, but he didn't. He put it down the spout so we don't get any of the interaction, but what we did get was this marked residual effect of cultivation. We didn't get a residual effect of liming because liming at that site was removing a problem of getting nutrient out of the soil, but it was doing nothing else. Now, uh, uh, in terms of that's an interpretation, Chris might beg to differ on these things and, uh, and probably the data, if it had been a better trial, we could have pushed the data harder. Uh, so anyhow, that's, that was a residual to cultivation but there was no residual to liming uh, because the farmer had gone across with available phosphate down the spout so we weren't relying on getting it out of the thing. And with that, and those were the figures and it was the third canola crop in a row so it wasn't very impressive and it was a major drought in that area. I think they got 66% of the lowest ever rainfall in 100 years so uh, it was... Uh, it might be high rainfall but it was a bloody dry year uh, and I would suggest that those three figures there we've got the data and I again haven't done the stats but I would suggest that being three times the others they are significantly different due to the cultivation so there's a residual effect of cultivation now in 2010 we wanted to do that trial better and so we put together a factorial. Oh, we, were all, we were interested in what liming and cultivation did to the availability of soil phosphate, but we were also interested in whether liming and cultivation affected the effectiveness of fertiliser phosphate down the spout. They're two very different things. They get confused very often in stuff I review and so people get the availability of the soil reserves where you need the root exploration can be very different from the 
placed reserves where you need far less exploration, you need different characteristics of the plant. Um, so we would tried to design a better looking, oh and incidentally this should have come a bit later but these were the profiles from that trial where we had the six treatments you can see there, uh, they were the main treatments that happened in the autumn, so it was dry cultivated and it was dry limed and so on and uh, it was a factorial of um, plus minus lime, two types of lime, high lime, the hydrated lime and lime sand and then there was a, a uh, plus minus cultivation. And you will note that, um, yeah, what does it use the mouse? Uh, here that the mixed ones had, that I've brought some of the topsoil stuff down mm -hmm. to these points here, uh, less obvious here. Our, our sampling was not really uh, magnificent for this particular exercise. It was tubes pushed in 10, 20, 30 and you've got a, if you've got a heterogeneous system and we've certainly got a heterogeneous system here uh, once you cultivate, uh, well even before you cultivate. So it's a very difficult sampling thing but it was quite obvious that um, the liming had affected, uh, where are we? Here we go. The liming had affected the, this is the unlimed and then this is the cultivated and then these are limed and cultivated variously with the different sources. Again I wouldn't like the error bars on that one Louise but they need to be done uh, and I don't like the sampling much but anyhow what I'm saying is at the site we had profound influences on some of the chemistry and we can come back to that. Um, here's an effect I developed a soil dryness in index where <laughs> with my trowel I just went across three inter rows and three rows and said percent of soil dry and uh, did that across all 72 plots. Uh, if you look at the means uh, at the bottom there you'll see no till 63, cultivated 39, no till 65, cultivated 40. That is that the no till is a lot drier than the cultivated but the cultivated still has patches of dryness in it. It's one of the problems and it might even be one of the advantages. Heterogeneity can often be a good thing because it allows some nutrients water roots to go down a profile and conserving the good aspects of stuff not going down the profile alongside. But anyhow the point I want to make there is that cultivation in this case made that soil wettable and that was immediately after seeding in May, uh, in May, no it might have even been immediately before seeding, anyhow there were hardly any plants there when I did, no it had to be immediately after seeding because I was doing rows and into rows they were on 18 centimetre spacing. Um, and then you'll notice with the counts which is the one at the bottom that there's no difference that we could pick up, that is that we couldn't pick up uh, differences in establishment. Now for non-wetting soils that's the first and main criterion is improving establishment. In that part of the world people are using quite an effective wetting agent. The main motivation, well some use it on pasture because early pasture growth is worth a fortune, but the main motivation in cropping is so that it synchronises weed establishment so that you can knock the weeds over. So they put wetting agent out in the autumn in the old days it used to be an autumn tickle, a scratch. Here they put it out in the autumn and it gives you synchronous weed establishment. It also lets water in, enter the profile where normally it wouldn't or where it would enter on fingers that enter uniformly. And so for weed control they, um, they get better effects. Now here I have not been able and we did count considerable lengths here to really come up with a significant impact of cultivation on establishment. You could kid yourself with a 67 to a 72 and a 69 to a 78 that it's slightly better establishment. They're all very poor numbers and again I put this down to the heterogeneity even with the cultivated ones that we still had dry soil in which seeds would not germinate and you need a lot of sampling and counting to be able to pick up the differences. Okay, how are we going? I believe that clock up there, do I? Um, so we had some early growth and have a look at the top line there, that's with nil phosphate down the spout. You've got again this cultivated, non-cultivated, so we've got no lime, no till, 
no lime cultivated, 66 goes to 225. High lime no till, 98 goes to 383. Now they are spectacular increases in early growth. Now in other parts of the world that's not necessarily a good thing because you might well hay a crop off later with a crook finish to the season. But in this part of the world early vigour normally means better yields. And they are spectacular. They were photographic. They were things we got very excited about. They made us visit it far more times than we would normally have visited the site. Uh, the other thing with that table, it's the factorial and I, in trying to keep the size of the trial down you'll notice I missed uh, uh, six treatments in the middle there. You always live to regret that. There was a rationale behind it that no one would go and cultivate without lime. If you're going to do a deep cultivation always put the lime out first so that you've got it mixed through and no one would do that so I didn't go beyond the nils with that. And the high lime no one would be going and spreading that on the surface. No one would be spreading it anyhow because it costs about um, 15 to 20 times as much per unit neutralising value as normal lime. But be that as it may, I live to regret not having that full factorial from an experimental point of view. Wouldn't have been that much more work. But have a look there as to what's actually happened with those early biomasses. As I say, the spectacular thing is the cultivation less spectacular and again subject to stats is the liming effects. Um, the, and, and that's the sort of thing that you were looking at. Now don't try reading all the hieroglyphs there for my, um, my purposes but the one straight down the middle there is no till, no lime and no pea. Now at 75 parts per million and in, in, in this case it was 90 parts per million in the soil I would be recommending no phosphate fertiliser and they normally no till so that's the crop they'd be looking at is that one in the middle there. Pretty bloody impressive except that these farmers are a lot smarter than I am. They even take their cat from CSBP and Summit who never recommend less than five down the spout and probably it's ten in this country and the man who highlighted this problem um, uh, Graham Laslett used to say soil testing is useless here just put 15 to 20 of pea down the spout and get on with the job. Now at $4 a kilogram of pea that's 60 to $80 a hectare down the spout when a bit of lime or a bit of cultivation might remove the need for that. Uh, but be that as it may uh, that particular one down the middle could be considered my recommendation for the area if they're no tilling. Uh, maybe not CSBPs. Alongside it to the, oh I get wrong lefts and rights but this one here, it's the same treatment but it's got 30 of P down the spout and even that crop is looking nothing like when you go further across cultivated high lime and 15 of P down the spout and nothing like cultivated lime sand and 30 of P down the spout if you go that side. Anyhow, don't get carried away with the detail there, uh, just that it was bloody spectacular and we had all sorts of people look at it but we didn't get a Guernsey to talk about it and so this being my 50th anniversary bloody talk I thought <laughs> I got prematurely cut off at the pass last year. They, they made me an offer in the middle of September when this was all very exciting, an offer I couldn't refuse dollar wise and kicked me out of the department and uh, I thought and this was going to die with it doesn't matter how good your people coming through are uh, they won't pick up something you're enthusiastic about so I thought I'd better give it an airing so you're getting the airing today um, and there's Reg who also got kicked in the guts but uh, uh, the package sort of compensated a bit for that he he's put up with me uh, nearly as long as my wife. He put up with me for <laughs> for 38 years. Uh, yeah, when I got back from a PhD, and he uh, he he used to think I was a complete nutter dickhead because he's very practical, and I'm uh, I'm uh, not. And the things I'd do wrong, and he'd straighten me out. Uh, but 
uh, somewhere along the line there was a bit of mutual respect either way and we um, managed to survive for 38 years which I think is better than most marriages. <laughs> um, this is one out at Earring and um, just two plots that serendipitously Dougie Sorkin's got excited about, that's an advisor at Narrage and, and uh, the no till and seven and a half of pee down the spout versus two tonnes of high lime uh, and zero pea and a bit of cultivation. We're looking at a final yield of 403 versus a final yield of 1115. I love the accuracy of that. 1.1 tonnes versus 0.4 of a tonne. Um, and if you like those are the yields. Now the thing to note there is that with cultivation and no lime, that red highlighted 995 is equivalent to um, 15 down the spout or that $60 down the spout and uh, an over on the lime sand one, uh, the same sort of, well, seven down the spout with lime sand. So the point about this is that there are major interactions in that table in terms of phosphate requirement and cultivation. And these are very important things for farmers, not for you, for you, there are some bloody interesting questions such as why is it so? Julia Sumner Miller when I was a pup, I don't know who does that now, but it was the best question known to man. Why is it so? And uh, and the farmers there, the few, couldn't even get a field day up, but the few that came and had a look are all going out and buying deep cultivators. Um, so, uh, and that's what's happening up in the northern wheat belt where they, it's not the same problems up there. In this case these originally came to the fore to bury uh, resistant weed seeds and you needed a mould board which completely inverted the soil so that all your topsoil was down at 30-40 centimetres and then um, you had uh, subsoil on top of it. And the biggest problem with that I discovered at Esperance last week when a group of us got together was that um, wind erosion Dan the man, people don't like cultivating because of the wind erosion hazard. 1980 scared shit out of them all down on the south coast and, uh, and you can still get wind erosion quite readily. For me it's a minor event but to a man, there were no women there were there Dan, but to a man they they hit me around the head as soon as I said, oh, you know, rough soil doesn't erode as much. You've only got infertile subsoil, doesn't matter much. Uh, and anyhow, the probabilities are not there. And if you do it at the right time when it's moist and you get a, you know, da 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 da. No, no chance of wind erosion. Now, the beauty of the forest country is that she won't bloody blow in the wind there. A little bit does on the sandy a bit when they overgraze them in a crook. But on, the, on these gravelly things and so on and you've got trees all around to cut the bloody wind speed at ground level and so on, wind erosion is not a major issue. So if we're going to play safe we'd better take our ploughs into that country. And um, this is one east of Bolgar. When we said you know, non-wetting soil is a problem at Bolgar, I don't know if any of you have been up that line, but if you go up the Bolgar 2J line it's all nice red friable soils and no, no non-wetting problems there. But between Bolgar and Gemelling it is all gutless sand to the level where there are lots of Tagasasti plantations and things. This guy happens to be a board member of WANFA, the No-Till Association, and he borrowed that plough you saw there from his neighbour and he, he got one money on a wind erosion funding to do clay rates by different methods of incorporation trial but in this paddock alongside where he had that trial he did half the paddock with a moldboard plough. What I love about that picture is it gives you an impression of the subsoil at about 30 centimetres. The sand and the gravel and there's a bit where you even glow, go through a clay ridge. Now there's sand there, deep sand in valleys where you can see it under no till, no disturbance. But most of those white patches you've got there just don't show up under a normal system. And yet that's what you're looking at in terms of soil variability. 
in this paddock. It's a beautiful example of what's happening down at 30 or 40 centimetres when you look at the surface and say, oh yeah, I'll give you one recommendation for that paddock and I'll put one hole down and get your upper and lower drain limits for a yield profit run on what your yield potential will be or something like that. The sampling problems of representing that paddock are phenomenal. Um, be that as it may, in this case he sowed it, he sowed at 50 centimetre spacing. At Bolgart you'd never do that, you lose yield. But his problem was that he'd ploughed in a load of stuff that got caught on his normal spacing at 25 centimetres. So that's what he's got there. Um, and this is, this is, he left a strip because he's on the board of Wanfer, he's got a no-till strip up the middle. Over that side is a new implement for handling non-wetting soils, a spader. It basically does a job like a rotary hoe but doesn't bash it up as much. It tends to maintain some heterogeneity. And the big thing that happened at this site was that that one and that one were chockers with weeds whereas the mole boarded one didn't have a weed to be seen. The next slide will prove <coughs> me wrong on that but I'm quite, you know, it was the weeds were insignificant. And you can see there that and, and we sampled on the sandy bit at the bottom and on the gravelly bit at the top there. And look at those differences in yields with the mole board. 2.7, if you did the normal no-till you're at 0.7 and then the spade is 1.5. Now the difference between the no-till and spader in terms of weeds, there was nothing. Uh, you know, they were both weedy and on 50 centimetres that means very weedy because you've got everything in the interrow going like the clappers. Um, and even down on the gutless sand we've got half a tonne, 0.1 of a tonne, 0.4 of a tonne for the three cultivations. Now again for you people, why is it so? There are a host of good reasons why it might be so. This is certainly not one of those acidity circumstances. So <coughs> why is it so? Uh, that was at harvest and you can see that I was telling lies about no weeds on the 2.7 bit. There were no weeds in the bulk of it, no weeds where we sampled it for those magic numbers of 2.7 tonnes but uh, you can see a bit of weed there when you're close to the weed source alongside and so on. Um, for me this is impressive, it's, as I said earlier it's like new land days, it's something worth looking at. And there are a host of reasons as to why you get the response. And the biggest problem with it is that every paddock is different and which reason is ruling in which paddock becomes an important thing. And then which remedy, there are lots of different remedies for different problems, is appropriate in different paddocks is also a thing. Um, so just from that there's an idea of the yield components. And the one that, that struck me was um, they, that... Um, in both on the sand and on the gravel that the harvest index was best. It grew the biggest biomass by a mile and it was a dry season at Bolgard I might say and the, this claying trial was running at about um, maximum on the claying trial was around about 1.8, 1.9 tonnes. Here we've got 2.7 on the gravel 1.4.7. We've got a factor of 3 or 4 due to the, cult the mole boarding um, and in dry seasons one expects that you use moisture early if you have a big biomass, 5.6 tonnes uh, and therefore you run out of water late so you expect the harvest index to go down and in fact it's higher so there's something about gravel and mulching and water relations and water penetration and so on and on this we did not go and do all the follow up measurements and things but it's all there for this year if anyone's interested. The site exists and he'll crop it, he'll bulk crop it again this year. And he'll probably take a lot more care with his weed control on the spaded areas and the um, no-till areas. Uh, but these are massive effects and they are very important for agriculture. And uh, so pros and cons of deep cultivation. Now I've got a name for being very negative because I hate salesmanship so if anyone's peddling a product I want to find the opposite you know what's wrong with it so if Dan peddles wind erosion I'll peddle non-wind erosion 
Chris is peddling bloody liming, I'll peddle non-liming. Um, and that does end up being pretty bloody negative, but it does raise both sides of the argument. And um, unfortunately, we're full of uh, the snake oil sales on almost everything known to man in agriculture, and they only peddle the positives, and they're normally just the positives done in a pot trial somewhere, nothing to do with whether that's liable to work under your in your conditions and your circumstance. And they'll give an average 10% response across all trials, which implies that everyone should buy my product and use it because they'll get a 10% response, but only two of the 30 trials responded and they had a good reason for it and they gave 50% or something like that response. Um, you've got this problem out there with snake oil sales. So there's a pros and cons of any practice, whether it's no-till, whether it's uh, you know GMs, whether it's climate change, James, uh, whether it's you know, th it doesn't matter what you face. There are pros and cons, and they are worth exploring if you like a good argument, and I like a good argument. Um, so there, you've had time to read all of that, but these are some of the things that deep cultivation can do for the farmer: berries, weeds. If you're going to deep cultivate, then put your lime out first, so that because it's a good opportunity to put it down uh, into depth, and that's normally a good place to have it. Though on these particular trials, we prefer it near the surface. Um, and this one of bearing nutrient fertility, um, we did a lot of work on placement of fertilizer to depth, and. Um, our hypothesis was that for crop an indeterminate crop like a lupin, that the spring growth when the surface soil is wetting and drying, it's a lot better having its pea at depths where it can is still actively taking it up. Your cereals are normally stocked, but it's actively taking it up from moist soil in the spring. Uh, and where we did these trials with and without irrigation, we got wet springs. As soon as we irrigated, we it rained in the spring. And the nature of the rain in the spring was such that on the non-irrigated ones, the surface was wetter for longer than the subsurface because they were five to ten millimetre showers as opposed to the twenty or thirty that wet to depth and then you dry from the top down. And we have also found that where I reckon we wouldn't get early responses to deep placement, we get um, uh, massive early responses now because people go in on first opportunity sowing and then they have a five week drought after seeding and you end up with a nutrient drought that stuff that's normally available in wet soil is unavailable. Um, anyhow, motor on. Um, oh, and this was one I was going to put in for money to look at gravel. I tried getting it up as an honours project here and no one's interested. Uh, not if you just put the written word, but the role of gravel in soils is a thing which there's nothing new, but they're having a new orientation to the old so that you can learn a bit more about what's going on, where, how and why is an interesting thing. For example, a simple thing like pH buffering capacity you do on the less than two millimetre fraction of soil and it says a tonne of lime, this is your 0.7 of a pH unit, but in actual fact if 50% of the soil is gravel, the tonne of lime might well lift you one unit, 1.3 because it's not reacting with the lime, uh, or alternatively your buffering goes deeper and you get a deeper effect. Uh, anyhow, that was thrown in for questions and I'd like to uh, acknowledge these people who've all had a hand in this work and I'm happy to take questions uh, but beware there's only ever time for one answer from me. I'm a bit long winded. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Martin seemed to be... Oh, do you want him to go through you? Yep. You want to pick and choose? Okay. You pick and choose. Okay. <laughs> Is the gravel content not taken into account by fertilizer advisory lighting in making the recommendation? No. Uh, what happens is that for nitrogen, 
even I say take gravel into account because if you're 50% gravel you've only got half the organic matter and, uh, and so on. Uh, CSBP in fact, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they had gravel using the same principle taken into account for um, phosphorus. I always worried about that because phosphorus is a very soil immobile nutrient in most of these high rainfall gravelly soils and and the plant is feeding off a concentration and uh, until and for early growth where we're seeing these responses you do not um, you haven't got root overlap such that uh, all the, all the evidence is that gravel should make you use phosphate more efficiently rather than less efficiently. Uh, but if you use that principle of dilution, that is the amount of phosphorus in the soil is important as opposed to the concentration in the soil, then you, um, uh, you'd say, um, you know, gravel should say your rates go up for phosphorus and as with nitrogen, whereas I, my, my betting is it probably goes the other way. And when I don't know, then you just say I'll do nothing about it. We won't have gravel in the equation for our soil phosphorus recommendations. Yeah. Um, Bill, <coughs> I don't know whether you've clarified the, uh, the deep ploughing, uh, but it's a one-off thing. Um, oh. I, I don't think you'd be advocating it every no, year because no. you lose the effect. No, well, there are a lot of things in uh, in the list of, uh, I mean, simple things like, um, oh, maybe I haven't got it there, it's in, it's in ones that I've got further down, but um, a ploughing is a disturbance of a long-term thing, so you get a lot of mineralisation of nitrogen, for example. Uh, a disturbance very often gives you aberrantly high responses and that's why we want the long-term aspects of this stuff as well as the short term. But um, more importantly is that this is considered to be a renovation thing that you, you, you go back, well they were saying 10 to 15 years, I would say 5 to 10 years and you might do a renovative thing depending on whether you've um, created uh, mechanical hard pans or uh, whatever. The reason for your ploughing will dictate to some extent, but most of these effects, you overcome them for a considerable period of time. And again, I use that frequency or proportion of farm you do as an anti-erosional thing, uh, you know, that you're playing the probability games again. Um, but you're right, Dan, it's, it, it's not considered to be a thing you do every year because that would be a disaster from a wind erosion point of view and so on. Bill, in your 50th year, you didn't tell us why it's so. You've got your list there. Is it, no, well is, it, is it some of those? Have you got any data to back it up? That's one. And, and, and the other one, the, the, lime, the lime treatment's still responding to P in sort of first the year old and the year after, which is the same as CSPP guys have found in sort of similar environment. Is, is that just sort of... The yeah, do I, what I'm saying is in that first trial, the farmer's blanket rate of P removed that effect so that you don't get the lime, but if he hadn't blanketed or he'd cut his rates back, he might well have seen a response to P, uh, sorry, a response to lime. Now, on, on this particular, the second trial, um, at the first level of redescription of your information, cultivation, there's a lot of papers stop at this level, cultivation had a major effect, full stop, and you're saying, why is it so? Now, I'm saying that part of the deal is to do with water relations, that, that high, um, uh, uh, that good performance there, what I noticed was that uh, when I went back at about that time, the big difference between the cultivated and the non-cultivated, they had all stages of development because you had plants coming through at different times, but the cultivated one on this side was at full ear emergence on almost all of them, whereas these other ones had obviously come through later and so they were um, still in boot. A lot of them were still in boot. Some were fully ear emerged but a lot in boot. So if I got a frost at this stage that one would be wiped out and that one would come through and give you the best yield. Uh, this is the thing with experimental data, you have to understand the agronomy and the physiology as well as the chemistry and all the rest. But the point here is that cultivation did that I emphasise the cultivation bits. There is an interaction. Lime also has an effect 
and the whole data need to be subject and I haven't done it because we did go and do hand harvests. I like interpreting yield component data and we did hand harvest but we've got cut back in resources so much that those hand harvest data have not been processed. That's head numbers, grain numbers, grain per head, grain size, harvest index, these sorts of things. I have not got from here so that you can do an appropriate interpretation of what the, how the crops saw the environment, it still leaves you with this one on the chemistry. And I showed you some initial profiles. I would much prefer that we went back and um, did a lot more detailed sampling uh, to get so that I could feel happier with the sampling uh, and the chemistry. Um, because there is some very interesting chemistry in there but, but I'm out of the system now and uh, I'll be arguing tomorrow for this sort of work but I'll probably lose the argument. Well, I'm not going to answer that. That's too difficult, that question, but um, somewhere here. Um, what are the implications for interpreting soil tests? I'll take as, uh, as part of that. Now, what happens is that you have brought very deficient subsoil up to the surface. You've still got fertile soil that was on the surface down further. It might even be more available certainly for late growth it will be, for early growth for hamey doots, down deeper. You send the soil test off to Andreas here and he's got a computer that churns out the results according to the chemistry of the soil sample and will say you should use a hell of a lot of phosphate on this site uh, and should you use a hell of a lot of phosphate on this site? We've now put it in at depth where it's in moist soil and that 90 parts per million is suddenly all available. Um, I mean at, at one stage with this problem CSBP were backing the one that these were very high phosphate fixing soils and that's why the critical levels were so high. I'm saying no there's something more than that in the system. Sorry I've, an obtuse answer to your question but it does raise this issue of where how you do evaluate the fertility after you've done this because it's a bit difficult to do it with a soil test. We do, we do, when we're choosing our sites, we go and do some preliminary, very rough profiles and only to 30 centimetres, but uh, in tens. Uh, now, the data I showed you with the profile, that's where we've gone to all the nil phosphate treatments. We could do them on the phosphated ones and do them between the rows and we'd get the same result. Uh, but we've gone and done all those, those six main treatments that went on prior to seeding. We sampled those uh, prior to seeding, which means there was no phosphate fertiliser to contaminate the thing except from past years and so on. So, um, yeah. I was wondering about other elements like calcium and potassium, perhaps, even magnesium, calcium and potassium. Potassium was a. You can get a depth function of potassium, 